363 in your hymnal, number 363. We're going to sing all three verses, so I'll let you remain seated. 363, to God be the glory. That is a great hymn of praise. Thank you for singing it uh, with us. So glad that you are here. I'm noting with a view to our study that this is uh, an anniversary of uh, sorts, our, our, our study of Genesis chapters 1 through 11 is now three years old. We gave birth back. We gave birth back. We gave birth back. We gave birth to the study back on November 16 of 2014. How thankful and how privileged we are uh, to be able to study the Word of God together. I will 
reiterate something that I said to our beloved Wednesday nighters, and it's uh, not a joke. I, uh, there's a part of me that apologizes for how quickly we have moved through the study. Uh, we have uh, a ways to go, and uh, you won't want to miss a lick of it. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 10. We're going to be reading verses 6 through 14. Genesis chapter 10, beginning with verse 6 and reading through the 14th verse. As you find it in the first book of the Bible, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rayama, Sabtika, and the sons of Rayama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begot Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, Akkad, Kelna, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city Re. Both and Kayla. Volunteer reader, please. <laughs> and reason between Nineveh and Kayla, the same as a great city. And Mizraim begat Ludim, and Ananim, and Lehabim, and Naphtalim, and Pathrusim, and Kathluim, out of whom came the Philistines, and Kaphtarim. And Canaan begat Sidon. Ah, I'm going to stop at verse 14. You may be seated for our time of prayer. <laughs> it's one of those things where you take a deep breath and you don't stop until you run out of it. Oh God, uh, we're so privileged to be in this place. We know the weather has impacted our attendance in some ways, and yet uh, each one of us here is uh, such a blessing to us and to you, and we thank you for that. And God, we've gathered together once again to worship our great God and our Savior. It's been a joy to sing praises to you already corporately. We probably haven't done that yet this week, at least for the last few days. And oh God, you are worthy of our praise and you are worthy of our all for many reasons, including you giving us your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior from sin. Thank you for our salvation, so rich and free in him and him alone. And help us, God, as we seek to share such salvation with others who do not yet know personally the one and only Savior. God, thank you for the way that you continue to show your blessings upon us. This is an exciting time of year, and we obviously are thinking an awful lot about Thanksgiving as Thanksgiving Day is just around the corner. And uh, invariably and rightfully so, we pause to think about all the things that we have to be thankful for. And the list, because of you, is really unending. And uh, James' words in 117 of his epistle are ringing in our hearts that every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable, neither shadow of turning. Oh God, you are so good, so gracious, so merciful. And again, we praise you. May every aspect of the service bring honor and glory to you, including our giving, and especially today, and especially this time of year. May you find us cheerful givers. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. We pray this with a view to you and your greatness, God, in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let's turn to number 386 for our last song before pastor. 386. When you find it, if you could stay with me, 386, we'll sing the first and the last, and starting on the second, last song, last verse. Kids are dismissed for junior church. I get that out? Yeah. 386, one and three.
Thank you, Alyssa. We appreciate that very much. Thank you, Karen, for your accompaniment with her and uh, beautiful. Wow, talk about making a way. God does things that only God can do. I remind you that our greatest uh, need was and is our sin, and how would you and I be rescued from the penalty and power and even someday the presence of sin? It would only be through God taking on flesh. This is the heart of the Christmas story and dwelling among men, living a life that you and I could not live. Dying a substitutionary death on Calvary's cross for us, the Bible makes it explicitly clear that he bore your and my penalty so that you and I wouldn't have to. He died, he shed his blood, he was buried, he rose again from the grave, a powerful, the powerful proclamation that he is, all that he claims to be the very son of God, God in the flesh, having come to rescue men. And he offers all of that, think about it, he offers all of that to us as a gracious and merciful gift. Yours for the taking. And that certainly is part of our heart cry this morning, that you have received the most gracious and most precious of gifts. And if not, that this would be the hour that you make that all-important decision. Let's pray together. Oh God, we uh, love being in your house. We love being together. We love listening to these beautiful songs. We love the way in which they exalt Christ and Christ alone. We love your word, the inscripturated, inerrant, infallible word of God to man. And we love the privilege that is ours and even the responsibility that we bear to be good students of the word. And we're quick and careful to ask for your help in regard to that all-important endeavor. We are stopping, looking, and listening. And we're doing so working our way through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. We're in a, a very interesting and unique and exciting section. And I pray that you'd continue to open our eyes and teach us and train us, and ultimately make us more like your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study in Genesis continues with chapter 10. We are working our way through the table of nations. Again, very, very exciting. I remind you quickly that we all go back to Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth or to list them in their birth order, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. Uh, We looked at the listing of Japheth's descendants last week. Seven sons are listed in verse 2, and then in verses 3 and 4, we met seven grandsons. Uh, But only the grandsons through two of the sons, which means, and you probably have already considered that, it means that uh, Japheth probably had many other grandsons. God giving us the names of just some, giving us the names that he wants us to have. This morning we begin to consider Ham's ancestry, which is much more involved Uh, Verse 6a says, and I quote, the sons of Ham. You may, by the way, be wondering why Ham's ancestry is listed before Shem's. You would anticipate that we would follow the birth order, and so we would begin with uh, Japheth, which is indeed what we do here. And then from Japheth, we would move to Shem's ancestry, and then finally to Ham, Ham being the youngest. And yet, the narrative does not follow that. We begin with Japheth, who indeed is the oldest, the firstborn, but then Ham's ancestry, who is the youngest, is listed before Shem. And of course, the question is why? 
And I believe if you've been with us, you've already begun to formulate an answer, but I will say so that I can draw you along with me, I will say to you that we don't know for sure why we have this particular order, but we can speculate just a bit, and one tidbit of that speculation relates to the original documents that Moses, the inspired writer and editor, may have had in writing uh, the, the, the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. When we read at the beginning of verse 10 in chapter 11, if you have your Bibles open, and I'm jumping ahead, obviously, we're in chapter 10, but look at verse 10 of chapter 11. The verse begins in this way, these are the generations of Shem. You may recall this, the literal reading of such phraseology because we've seen it before. In fact, we're more and more understanding and it's not that we would have a, um, it's not that we would have this memorized, but we're more and more understanding that there's a distinct possibility that Moses was working with a goodly number of original documents, which is an amazing contemplation. And it could very well have been that Moses was, was working off from and again, he's superintended by the Holy Spirit of God, but Moses perhaps was working off from an original document that had been originally written by Shem himself. And so we get the end, possibly we get to the end of Shem's personal um, records with verse 10 of chapter 11, but it actually goes back to the very first verse of chapter 10. And so from Genesis chapter 10, verse 1b, <laughs> to Genesis chapter 11 and verse 10a, we could very well be seeing Moses working under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit of God off from an original document that had originally been written by Shem. But how does that then in turn come into play with our question, why is Ham's ancestry listed before Shem's? And I actually have a multifold answer to you, but first of all this, I, I actually believe this, by the way, or I wouldn't even be bringing it up with you, that Shem, in honor of his brothers, if he is indeed the original writer here, then Shem, in honor of his brothers, one older and one younger, lists them and their ancestral records first before he cites his own. So there might even be a little bit of human honor that comes into play with this. But you and I have already seen other things that also uh, bear in our answer as to why Ham's ancestry is listed before Shem's, two other things. One, we've already identified that once we get to Genesis chapter 11, with a reiteration and actually um, a, a further listing of Shem's ancestry, that we are for the most part going to be sticking with Shem's ancestry right through the rest of the book of God. Because Shem, as you know, and his descendants produce the Savior. And all of Scripture, as you know, points to and funnels into the Lord Jesus Christ. And so once we, um, once we get to Shem with the fullness of his genealogy, then there will be no stopping as we follow his descendants and ultimately arrive at the Lord Jesus Christ. And then if you follow that, one other thing related. It's actually a principle that I believe you know to be true of God. And, and, and listen, it's encouraging. God almost always saves the best for last. Just in case you're at a juncture in your earthly sojourn where you're down and out, just in case you're facing all kinds of trials and tribulations. Just in case you're 
enveloped with your troubles. There really is a better day coming. And God does save the best for last. I couldn't help but think of a couple of our verses to you off first, uh, Corinthians 2 9, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. Man, if you're a lover of God, there's a great day coming. And, 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 and uh, this earthly sojourn of ours. And when everything is said and done, I know that we will testify that the Joy outweighed the sorrow, but this earthly sojourn of ours with all of its sorrows. We are in the process. It's part of the reason why we are here. That's why a a goodly number of you show up on Wednesday night because you are worshiping and serving a faithful God who meets all of your needs, who is constantly equipping and constantly encouraging. You worship a God who both hears and answers prayer. And he faithfully and perfectly meets our needs. But this earthly sojourn is tough. God saves the best for last. And you and I don't even have an inkling of an idea. And God's talked to us about it. Isn't that amazing what God does? He gives us all these Details about glory, and then he says, you don't even have an idea. Wow. What a great day that's going to be. And you can hear again the Spirit of God. Maybe he's just whispering the recommissioning. Listen, uh, you're headed to glory, so trust me now. And allow me to work in your life now and impact people for Christ now. And, and edify and evangelize now. And work. Even with sacrifice now. Because there's a, dra- a, a great day coming. And I thought of Paul's words in Romans 8 and 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you. What a God. He meets our needs perfectly, but we know him to be one who saves the best for last. Glory is coming. and Because of that, we have all the motivation we need in order to live out our lives for him. A better day is coming. Now a closer look at Ham's ancestry. Verse 6 of Genesis 10, I am reading. And the sons of Ham, here they are, Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. You may recall back when we looked at Japheth and we're thinking about his descendants and we sort of looked at, a, at an invisible map together. And, and we tried to envision in our mind's eye where Babel is and We know from a historical standpoint, like some of the terminology used to describe the area of Babel, you historians will recognize like the the terminology, the Fertile Crescent or Mesopotamia. For you you geographists, you you will be familiar with the two major uh, rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and you picture Babel as being right between them. And then we focused on the sons of Japheth, and we watched as they basically went north. We said they not only went due north, but they also went northeast and also northwest. And we were especially interested in the northwest movement because that ultimately arrives at the Indo-European people group, which most of us are a part of. Now, with Ham, we watch as he moves and his descendants move from Babel south. Again, not just due south, but also southeast and also southwest. So as we begin to think about the descendants of Ham, and even as we listen to these names of his ancestry, 
we are prompted to think of and to recognize that Ham's sons and his grandsons are the ones who produce the African and Arabian nations. And we are interested. By the way, the only exception is Canaan, uh, who was one of Ham's sons, as you know. Verse 6 could read like this. I want you to look at the verse, but I'm giving you uh, what could be a, a legitimate reading. Verse 6, the sons of Ham, Ethiopia, Egypt, Libya, and biblical Canaan. Did you catch it? The sons of Ham, Ethiopia, Egypt, Libya, and biblical Canaan. For Cush will father the Ethiopians. And you may have even read about this, that the Ethiopians still to this day are referred to as Cushites. Cush will father the Ethiopians. Mizraim will father the Egyptians. Put will father the Libyans. And Canaan, of course, will father the biblical Canaanites. The sons of Canaan, and I, I, I was going to read right on for our scripture reading this morning, and I'm glad you stopped me, but the sons of Canaan, which we will speak of um, a little bit later in the genealogy, move west of Babel, but not very far south. And so, and of course, I'm just reminding you of this, we'll say more about it again as we proceed, that you, you know that the Canaanites, Canaanites with a view to Israel are actually occupying the promised land. So they don't go very far south. Most of Ham's descendants do, but again, not Canaan. Now verse 7, let me go ahead and read verse 7, since I'm so good at these names. I, I, I'm not kidding you, this is a riot to me. It may be a measure of my, uh, of my uh, deepening infirmities. A and actually, I, I mean, I'm concerned about how long you'll put up with me, but, but actually, uh, I, I, I actually... I actually like uh, the deepening infirmities because you have reminded me already today that God saves the best for last. Verse 7. And the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rehama, and Sabtika, and the sons of Rehama, Sheba, and D Dan. Verse 7 lists five sons of Cush and then two of Cush's grandsons through Ramah. I don't know if you like taking notes in your Bible, and again, I'm glad many of you are using um, study Bibles, and perhaps these are already noted for you. And, and I, I think that um, we may already have and perhaps will, as we proceed, be sharing some things that maybe conflict just a little bit with uh, some other stuff that you have heard and read. I, I am being very, very careful, again, in communicating to you what is the consensus. These sons and grandsons, if, if, let me get back to taking a note. If, if you are accustomed to writing something in the... Uh, on, in your Bible, then what you'll want to write next to verse... Seven is, is that these sons and grandsons primarily populate Arabia. Wow. You, you're quick, even with our contemporary thinking, to think of Saudi Arabia, for instance. And you, one of the reasons why you're quick to think of Saudi Arabia is because of the vastness of her land. Then in verses 8 through 12, we have an interesting insertion. I think you have been looking forward to this, and if you have, then you're probably going to be disappointed in what I'm about to say to you. The story of Nimrod. I'm using the, the word story in quotes. What we mean by that, and you know this, is that this is a, the very interesting biblical historical narrative of the historical figure Nimrod. It's history through and through. 
Nimrod, we know from the narrative that he was the sixth son of Cush, and this is part that you'll be disappointed in. We, we do not, I knew that we would not. I know y'all. We, we, we will consider this interesting insertion next week, the Lord willing. Now drop down to verses 13 and 14. Again, I am reading. And Mizraim begat Ludim, and Anamim, and Lahabim, and Naphtahim, and Pathrusim, and Kasluhim, out of whom came the Philistines, and Kaphtorim. Mizraim, as we've already noted, is one of Ham's sons and the father of the Egyptians. And now we have listed Mizraim's sons, seven of them. Interestingly so, we don't know a lot about these seven sons, although Moses does note that one of Mizraim's sons listed here will down the road have a tie to the Philistines, you might say fathering them. And of course you are very familiar with the Philistines. But in regard to these men listed in verses 13 and 14, the broad consensus is that these seven sons move south out of Egypt into other parts of Africa. Are you interested? Well, Pastor Tom, why would I be interested? Because once again, we have beloved missionaries ministering to these folks. This is amazing to me. We only go so long. We're working our way through the table of nations. And please understand, folks, we're going back 4,000 years in time. Why would we even care about this stuff? And how in the world could it ever have any application to us? But God is setting the record straight. And we realize now that we're actually looking directly at our ancestors. It's exciting. And we're prompted to not only look at people groups, but we are prompted to consider our beloved missionaries that are ministering to these particular people groups. It's 4,000-year-old stuff, and it couldn't be any more applicable to our lives. Again, oh, the realness of this. You want to know who's ministering to the sons of Mizraim? our beloved missionaries, the Tates and the Dannenbergs. By the way, one other thing, because I picture everything, you can, you, you can take uh, Mizraim and Cush and Put at the top of Africa, and you can take your three fingers and go like that. And when you do, you'll recognize that all of the African nations below Egypt, Ethiopia, and Libya are impacted directly by the sons of Mizraim. So we have missionaries, the Tates and the Dannenbergs, who are ministering certainly to the sons of Ham, but more specifically and more than likely, the sons of Mizraim. Our missionaries. We are back to the question, why? Again, I restate that this is 4,000-year-old information. What in the world would it have anything to do with us? And then God sets a record straight and says, listen, these are your direct to descendants and take a look at your missions family that is so precious to you and continues to grow because of the faithful and gracious and um, gracious giving of the people in that place and realize that each and every one of them are engaged in ministering to these various people groups. And, and we're back to the question, why? Why in the world would 
there even be missionaries? And why in the world would we send missionaries? And why in the world would missionaries go? I mean, plug this back into, again, evolution versus creationism. You do realize that, don't you? And again, you need to recognize that in, in many parts of our public school system, our students are being taught the false theory of evolution. Evolution does not produce missionaries. In fact, evolution would say to your beloved missionaries, you are absolutely nuts, especially the Tates and the Dannenbergs. They're going to minister to people that are so primitive that they're closer to the ape than the man. What fools! God, what kind of deal is this? Can you imagine? We not only weep on our own, but we weep for people like the Tates. Our hearts and minds go back to the day when they had to bid farewell to Roger and Julie and at the time Emily and Amy and Josiah. Why? Roger, Julie, why would you go? Why would you expend yourself on such people groups? That's the point. It's a people group. They're going to minister to their relatives. And I'm telling you, Roger and Julie and John and Paula, they know that the sons of Mizraim are in trouble. And they're in trouble for the same reason why any other people group is in trouble, and they're in trouble for the same reason why you and I, me, were in trouble. Of course, it is because of our sin. And so they go. You send them. And they go to tell their relatives. Remember, one race human, we all go back to Adam, thus the problem with sin universal problem. They go to tell sinners of the Savior. The Tates and the Dannenbergs ministering to the sons of Mizraim. Their relatives. I gladly tell you again of the Savior. And I remind you that you are, each one, a missionary. I'm amazed at every turn in our study in Genesis, how we keep coming back to Christ and the blessed gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's what I'm especially concerned about. It's not enough to hear about Jesus. By the way, if I can switch, uh, if I can switch mission fields with you for just a moment, Ann and I had the Ann and I've had the privilege of, of visiting uh, Logan and Kendra in Indonesia twice. The second time that we went, we flew into uh, the jungle we landed on the side of a mountain. We tried to take you there a little bit with uh, pictures and videos, but oh, you, you would have had to have been there. It seemed that the whole village was uh, assembled. They weren't, you know, excited about Pastor Tom. They were excited about the plane. But it's, it, it creates such an excitement that there's na neighboring villages. The people of neighboring vi vi villages that show up. And, and a number of the leaders of area villages showed up on that particular day. And the only thing they were wearing, two things. A gourd. And then they had either, either across their back or in their hand, they had... 
a bow and arrow or a spear or a machete. That, by the way, is quite the welcoming party. The evolutionists would look at them and say, wow, they have not evolved very far. Logan and Kendra would look and say, son of Adam needs Jesus. So too, every member of our missions family. Here's what I'm especially concerned about for you. You've heard all about Jesus. We even say that, right? We say, you've heard this. If you've testified to someone, especially someone who's been around, maybe a little bit older, they, it's not unusual for them to say, oh, I've, I've heard all about that stuff. We say, oh, I know all about that stuff. But I remind you, and I guess it's appropriate in light of the fact that we moved into the holiday season, Thanksgiving first, we're not jumping the gun, but then Christmas. Oh, I guess we are jumping the gun. Christmas decorations already. So since they're already up, I'll talk about the tree and the gift under the tree. You absolutely can perish knowing and seeing the gift for you under the tree by simply not receiving it. It's a very simplistic illustration of what we do with the most important thing in life. Please understand, knowing about Jesus will not get you into glory. Having heard all about Jesus does not pave the way for your entrance into heaven. It's a gift. It must be received. Question. Have you received him? Have you taken him? If not, I would pray that you even now would pray to do that very thing. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? One further thought to those of you who have not yet trusted Christ, I'm pleading with God that you would do so even now. And one other personal plea to you, that if you do, would you let me know? Oh, man, would I love to know. And child of God, again, stand in awe with me of the word of God. This is absolutely amazing. We go back literally thousands of years into human history. And we're seeing nothing but things that have complete and total application to our lives. And in the end here, we're reminded again of the all-important ministry of our missionaries and that you and I ought to be a missionary. And so you can talk to God about that as well. Only Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in the house of God. Thank you again for the vital nature of our study. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we don't have to work at seeing how these things apply to our lives. And thank you how that at every turn we are brought back to the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessed gospel, good news. For sinners, there is a Savior and only one. I pray that each one who is here today has trusted him. Not just that they know about him or have heard of him, but they have taken him with a heartfelt prayer, receiving them into their hearts and lives. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to number 417. 417, just as I am. Let's stand together, closing 417, the first verse.
Brother Dan, would you close us in a word of prayer? Thank you, our Father in heaven, for this day to come together and worship and praise you. This week is going to be a week to remember you and all you've done for so many people, so many places. Help us always to remember, O oh God, our Father, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that you raised him from the dead. But now by your grace, we can live for him who died for us. For we have been buried with him, with Christ, and raised to a new life. Help us remember that today is the day that you've made, Lord. And we may be glad and rejoice in it. Thank you, O oh God, that our names have been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, written down in heaven. And for your indescribable gift of everlasting life, through faith in Jesus, by your grace, help us to always remember that, and that you have saved the best for last. The best is yet to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.